Awesome. Well, we are so excited to have everyone joining us today. And some quick introductions. Um, I'm Amy Schultz. I am a second year PhD student in plant breeding. And I'm Merritt Kaipo Birch. I'm a third year PhD student also in plant breeding. Amy and I work in the same lab and study uh, corn. So hopefully some initial instructions on, on gathering some game materials were sent out previously, but overall the game setup is really, really simple. But, you know, as the overall agenda for today is uh, doing some setups and some intros of the game, uh, making ancient seeds and testing them, and then uh, switching up things and making domesticated seeds and testing them, and then we'll have some discussion afterwards. So the setup very simple. Uh, you, you place a hairdryer or a fan on an elevated surface like a table or a chair, um, both work great. And then you place a tape measure on the floor and mark every 12 inches or one foot with tape. Um, we have masking tape that we mark this off with. And you could just label on the tape like one foot, two foot, three feet, up to six or 10 feet, depending on the strength of your hairdryer. So this is what the setup looks like in pictures. On this table, we have a hairdryer propped up on a table and then masking tape every foot apart to just kind of show how far our seeds disperse. And then next up is to gather some supplies. We found that rocks, napkins work really well, feathers, balloons, pipe cleaners, tape, and of course, like little note cards that will serve as your seeds for the game. If you have other materials, that's fine. It's really up to your own creativity, what kind of things that you uh, design your seeds with. So we're gonna give everybody a few minutes to make sure that everything is set up. And then, you know, once you're ready, go ahead and type in the chat that you're good to go. And then we will go ahead and move forward with round one. Yeah, and while you're getting your supplies, you know, you can think about, we have a couple of examples here, some fun stuff. We have these little pom-poms that are pretty light and fluffy. We have different rocks here. So those are pretty heavy. We also have some fun things like napkins and have ribbons. I don't know. Something could be done with those. And lots of really fun balloons. <laughs> really anything works. I mean, even things like in your, your cupboard at home would probably work great for this. <laughs> Make sure to get out a pen as well. That would also help. So next, the goal of this round is for you to become an ancient plant. So imagine you're a plant in the wild and your goal is to spread your seeds as far and as wide as you possibly can. And so what you're going to end up doing is you're going to get three note cards and write your name on them, especially if you're in a group. If it's just you, don't worry about writing your name. And next you're going to gather some of the supplies we talked about so your balloons pom-poms you could use other note cards it's good to have some tape and get all that together and then you're going to have three minutes to attach your supplies to your note cards and then once those three minutes are up you're going to drop seats in front of whatever air moving device you have this can be a hair dryer a fan we've done this outside with a leaf blower so that could be something fun to do afterwards and the seed that travels the furthest is going to win. So are there any questions? Feel free to type them in the chat. Otherwise, we do have some examples here before you get started. Yeah, so you can design your seeds to whatever wild ideas you have in your head. You know, some examples for inspiration are shown here because the goal is to maximize the dispersal of our seeds, like putting things in lightweight objects really help like balloons, you can make parachutes, paper airplanes or cones, anything that really helps capture the wind really well. Some examples of bad seeds in this case might be like rocks um, filled up in balloons or just rocks taped to your note cards and things like that. So try to make things as lightweight as possible. Awesome. Well, it's time for you guys to start making your seeds. So remember, you want them to travel the furthest. 
and you are going to have three minutes to go. And if folks have any questions during this time, feel free to type them in the chat. Uh, one common question is that the three seeds don't have to be the same. They can be anything you want them to be. Thanks, Merritt. That's a nice comment. <laughs> That's good because mine definitely are not pretty. So <laughs> they don't have to be. <laughs> There's definitely a wide array of tactics. Um, in this case, we have flowers, so we wanted to use them. <laughs> oh my gosh, we only have 30 seconds left. Uh oh. Hey, 10 seconds. Keep it all together. Come on. <laughs> okay, time is up. So now it's time to test out your seeds. So go ahead and line up and drop them in front of a hairdryer or a fan, whatever else you might have. And as you're going, go ahead and type in the chat box how far your seeds went. Yeah, for the ones that we tested before, you know, there's a wide range. Like some didn't even go at all. They're just right below the hair dryer. Some went, oh, that one went three feet. Balloon went like four. So there's quite the range that things can really, really travel. We'll give you guys a couple minutes to go ahead and drop your seeds. I like the different ideas that are happening on video. Very nice. Love them. Awesome. Okay. Well, so yeah, what worked well and what didn't work well in your test? If folks want to type that into the chat, that would be great. I'd love to see what people came up with because, you know, this is something where you can be really creative and there's no one thing that absolutely works. So yeah, go ahead and, and type those, those responses in the chat and I'll get to them in a little bit. And we'll also show you a couple more examples of, of what we tried out in the past. But as we kind of wait for things to come in, I'll talk about two different methods that two plants use to disperse their seeds uh, really far. One of them is dandelion plants and one is helicopter plants. So uh, how do helicopter plants work? Helicopter plants are seeds from maple trees and maple trees use three key features to help them stay afloat. The first feature is that the large surface area of the wings on the seeds cause them to stay afloat for longer. The second thing is that the seeds prolong their time in the air by spinning or twirling in the air for long periods of time. 
maple seeds can get then like caught in the wind and then be able to spin and fly really far away from the, the, the original tree that they fell down from. So that really helps with dispersal over time. And the last thing that helicopter plants do to help help them disperse is create a tornado-like vortex that comes from the wings, lowering the air pressure that's around them over the upper surface of the seed. And so this helps suck the wings upwards as they're twirling down. And so it's a cool interaction of like physics and biology coming together to twirl the seeds and like alter the air pressure around them to help them like little, little poof upwards as they get caught in the wind and fly a little bit more. All right, and the second plant is dandelions. And I feel like every summer, it's really fun to just go around and like pick up these and then blow them. Even as an adult, I do this. The, uh, the dandelion seed is the little brown oval that's at the bottom of this little image right here. And it, you know, just the overall structure of the dandelion seed kind of looks like a parachute, but the heavier thing down at the bottom and the little parachute up top, those little parachute little Strings are called filaments and they allow dandelions to fly up to uh, miles away from the plant that they originated from. Just like helicopter plants, they're able to do this by creating a vortex of air caused by air moving through the little filaments. And there's a little image on the side that shows this of as the air is going through the dandelion, it creates a little vortex that helps propel it upwards and lifts the seed up into the air. And so that little extra lift and the wind that catches it helps the dandelions fly really, really far. And the amount of space is really saved between the different filaments on the dandelion. And so that also helps it become stable in the wind. So I will kind of look into the chat now and see what else people came up to. Oh, some people got their seeds to fly up to a, a foot far. Use a mask as a parachute. Parachutes really help uh, capture the wind, like dandelion plants. Anything that really helps capture that wind, it's really great. See bubble wrap, very nice. It's a nice lightweight item that can catch a lot of wind. Someone else tried bubble wrap and didn't work so well with them. Okay, hit or miss. Okay. Oh yeah, and paper. Paper is heavy in and of itself, but you know, I'm hoping that in that first round, that you know, the things that kind of worked were very light, had a very large surface area. Um, and, you know, maybe you created or had time to create things that helped prolong time in the air, like wings or uh, vortexes. We have a couple examples here. Yeah. So one example from when we tried this out on some friends was they ended up cutting their seed into a bunch of different, I guess, they cut a bunch of holes in it. So you can actually it's all crumpled up, but you can lay it flat and see how this used to be the seed. So there's, they're maximizing kind of that airspace and they crumpled it up like this and put it in front of the fan and it actually traveled really far. It was quite impressive. Yeah. Another example is this cone. It's just the note card just spiraled up and it was able to catch wind so well that I think this one ended up traveling like 20 feet, but that was with the leaf blower. So it was a little bit stronger. And then this one traveled with the leaf blower, I want to say at least 10 feet, but it, it was, you can see the seed here, some feathers on there. So kind of like a helicopter plant. And then it actually parachute uh, attached to it. So um, it was dropped with the parachute in front of the leaf blower and traveled quite far. Yeah. All right, round two. <laughs> So in this round, you are now going to become domesticated. So an, an ancient farmer now wants to collect your seeds for food. So you need to think about how would you limit your dispersal of your seeds so that's the easiest for the farmer to collect them. So your goal is to keep your seeds as close together and to get them to travel the least. Oh yeah. And so again, here's a couple examples. So it's flipped around from last time. The goal is to limit dispersal. So good examples would be, again, uh, balloons filled with rocks, cones filled with rocks, or just anything that really weighs down your note cards um, as best as possible. And we're trying to potentially avoid things that would make your seeds disperse really far. So parachutes again, um, cones or any like 
accordion-like paper structures to make things lightweight. So yeah, if folks want to go ahead and start making your seeds, the goal again is to uh, limit or the dispersal of your seeds. And again, we have three minutes to start making things. We have an example video here of, of someone trying to um, create their three seeds, but again, use any uh, wild ideas that you have in your head. Anything really works. And the big thing to keep in mind here is there's no right or wrong approach. Um, the way that our roommate did this one when we were videoing her is completely different than the way I approach it as to the way Merritt's approached it. So um, yeah, use your imagination. Hey, you have just under 30 seconds left. Okay, time is up. So it is time to test your seeds. Let's go ahead and drop them in front of our hair dryers or fans or whatever you may have and see how far we can get them to travel. And you can see this first one fell. Actually, they're all falling at about a foot. I think that one there was mine and it went straight down. A couple of them are actually traveling pretty far. Oh, geez. that one went over well, almost a foot. <laughs> that one's falling apart. <laughs> so we'll give people one more minute to go ahead and drop them. Okay, so you may have noticed that a lot of your seeds did not travel very far, which is great. But that means we need to have a quick tiebreaker round in here. And so one thing that farmers find really important is ease of harvest. And so they want to be able to very quickly get their seeds back without having to worry about pulling off a ton of things. And that's gonna be the plant that they pick to continue on for the next generation. So we're gonna have you guys put all your seeds on the table or wherever you have it and we're going to time how quickly it takes for you to get just the note cards out. We don't want anything else attached to it. So get ready, 
set and go. See furious untaping right now. <laughs> it's amazing. <laughs> oh yeah. These are people showing their stuff in front of the camera. Awesome. Barrett, you're still on taping, thanks. <laughs> Used a lot of tape. My intricate paper clipping was perhaps a mistake. <laughs> Done. Nice. Awesome. Yeah, you can see in our video here that the three different methods that we took had quite different outcomes on who maybe had the cleanest versus who still had tape versus who's got ripped up in the process. Oh, yes. <laughs> so if you guys would like to type in the chat, you know, what worked well versus what didn't work well uh, when it came to what seeds were able to disperse the least and not travel far. And then also, if you have any ideas on what traits you think ancient farmers selected upon, go ahead and write that in the chat as well. I'd love to kind of hear it. Um, I've kind of hinted at a couple, so um, I would love to hear what you guys all think. Taping a hacky sack to your seeds worked very well. I like that. Round and heavy. Absolutely. So what about maybe things that farmers would have selected for? Oh, I see light balloons did not work. Folding seeds into little balls. That's a good idea. All great suggestions. Yeah, so kind of hitting on this third area of, you know, what farmers may or may not have selected on kind of the key thing that we have talked about is this whole dispersal. And so, uh, yes, easy to separate from plants. That's a great thing to bring up. So what we have here is a photo of something called seed shattering. And so this is a plant that shatters and its seeds disperse all over the place. And so the farmer would have to go and actually pick up all the seeds from the ground, which would make it really hard to harvest versus this plant here is what we call non-shattering. So it's really easy for the farmer to take it and just basically take the stem and they can easily harvest that seed and collect it, um, but it's still easily removed from the plant. Another thing to think about here is, you know, an ear of corn, it's very easy to take from the plant. It's easy to pull the husk off from it. And as Merritt has here, it has this wonderful thing uh, where the cob allows for hundreds upon hundreds of seeds to be on the plant and easily harvested. And so kind of one of the key plants that we talk about with domestication is corn or maize. And so maize itself was domesticated from this wild plant called teosinte. And from here, we can kind of see some of the main traits that farmers selected for. So it's this really big, bushy plant. It has a lot of these what are called lateral branches on the side. And on these branches here in this little circle, you can see this itty bitty little ear with very hard seeds. And so that would not be fun for a farmer to go out into the field and harvest. And so what has happened is that ancient farmers have actually been able to take these seeds and essentially through generations and many, many years of selection, they've actually turned that hard outer casing inside out and it's essentially turned into the cob of your modern day ear. And so we went from tiny little seeds to a large ear. And they've also selected for, you know, one or two large ears per plant. So now, you know, a farmer can go and harvest it with machines very easily, or you could pick out sweet corn, you know, with your own hands and not have to worry about a ton of little seeds. And so this kind of just summarizes a lot of what 
we have talked about so far how you know your wild plants are going to have completely different dispersal methods than your domesticated ones. So we're selecting again for less shattering. We want our seeds to stay close together. We have larger, heavier seeds. If you notice with that Teosinte example, they were really tiny versus you know, a really big ear. Uh, less branches overall, so you're not getting that bushy plant. And one thing that we didn't talk about, but is something that's really important to keep in mind is that we've actually bred plants to be less sensitive to day length. And so uh, what happens there means that the plants all grow and mature at the same time, so they can be harvested at the same time, versus plants that are more sensitive to day length, they can only be grown in one area and they don't really have a set maturity time. So they're going to just keep growing and growing, kind of be harvested at random times, which is not fun for the farmer. They'd rather grow out in the field and harvest in one day. And so from there, this kind of wraps up the workshop portion, but we would love to answer any questions or if you guys want to do kind of a show and tell and let us see what some of your different seeds were, we would love to do that. Otherwise, we are happy to uh, show some fun corn that we have here with us or talk more about domestication. And feel free to contact us after this with any other questions you might have. Our email addresses are up on the screen. It's a question in the chat of, hi, Amy and Merritt, what do you work on in grad school? And I'll let Amy answer that oh, question I'll let you first. Go first. <laughs> <laughs> so I have a couple of different projects, but uh, right now I'm really interested in understanding how two different corn plants interact with one another in the field. And so uh, do they really compete for resources and cause their neighboring plant to be shorter and have you know a smaller ear or do they get along with one another um, and not basically steal all their neighbors resources and then both of them are you know benefiting and you get a higher yield in the field. Yeah and what I work on is looking at all of the different kinds of traits that are in corn so that could be how big the ear is, how tall the plants are, what time that they start to flower in the field and things like that and I try to see if there's any shared ways that those traits are controlled and I look at different genetic mechanisms behind them to see how they might potentially use those same mechanisms to you know, both create, you know, a large ear versus a tall plant. And yeah, I just kind of look for, for sharing between traits. So both corn people very much. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot of corn energy in this room. 